uh, due to our recent developments in the in this uh, this week in the candidate tournaments uh, i have decided to dedicate our games for today for the one and only uh, fabiano carana <music> So go, good job Fabi and we are going to uh, see how this uh, amazing player used his uh, pawn, uh, pawns to, to finish his matches and uh, as well how, how he beat uh, uh, other players and really really uh, congratulations to, to Fabiano, uh, well done. Now before I, before I um, begin this lecture today I would like to ask us a, a small question which uh, um, nobody else has ever asked before. No grandmaster, no, no international master, no, no coach. And I would like to ask this question to, uh, uh, to our viewers at home uh, as well to our viewers here at the St. Louis Chess Club. And the question is, what amount would you put, uh, uh, or what, what amount of value, of dollar amount, would you put on uh, uh, touching a piece? And just for our example today, because we have our lecture uh, about um, pawns, let's say I have, a, I have a pawn in my hand and just touching the pawn, how much can it cost you? When I say touch, I say just touch. So if, if we have a, a pawn here, uh, if you guys can throw me a pawn, and I, I can show you. Whoop, special effects. I have a pawn here, that's all that I'm doing. I'm just touching with the tip of my finger. Doesn't even, <laughs> it doesn't even matter which finger <laughs> I'm touching with this. So how much would it cost you? What do you guys think? Uh, today I'm going to show you, uh, I'm actually going to, sh to show you uh, that uh, a touch of a pawn can be worth half a million dollars, $500,000. I mean, think about it, I mean, some, some people, if somebody wins $500,000, uh, for them it's, for some people, it's uh, you know it's the whole amount of money you're making in a lifetime. Maybe you know maybe it's maybe it's enough for two lifetimes. Um, so just you know just small touch of a piece that that can be uh, the difference. Um, so let me prove it to you today. Let's look at the, at the last game that was played between uh, Alexander Grishuk and Fabiano Carana in our last game. Um, <coughs> in the candidates tournament which just happened in berlin okay so as everybody knows uh, uh fabiano was uh, was leading half point ahead uh, but after th after him uh we had uh, uh, we had karyakin and we also had mamidyarov uh so it quite it was quite a, a very difficult decision for him you know how to play uh, because he was playing fabiano was playing the black pieces and um, Karyakin was, was playing with the white pieces. So, and, and he knew that if he would tie with them, he is actually going to lose the, uh, you know, the championship. And by the way, in the, in the, I think in, in the candidates, it's not about money as much as um, you know, going to the next step, which is challenging uh, the world champion. Um, so you know, it's, 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 it's a tough position. So how do you play with black? I mean, are you going to be very aggressive? And are you going to try to sacrifice lots of pieces? Um, you're going to play a very sharp opening to, to, to let you uh, to have the chances to win the game? Or are you going to be playing solid because you're still playing with black? So it's a very interesting, you know, very interesting question. And, uh, you know, as, as for myself, I, I've had, uh, I've had the, the opportunity to be in such a position myself and uh, with black and I, and I chose the sharp way. And actually I lost the game because I was sacrificing too many pieces and I lost the championship. But um, so Karana chose the other way around. Uh, so let's see what happens. So Grishuk started with this move E4 and uh, uh, Fabiano started with E5. We just know that E5 is probably one of the most, um, you know, just one of the most solid responses against e4. If you, for example, would play for, for a win, uh, you know, try to look at some sharp positions, you would start with, with this move c5, and we have lots of uh, Sicilian defenses variations. Okay, so e5 was played, knight to f3, and obviously we, we know that the main move here is a knight going to c6. Um, also a very solid, solid uh, opening, 
but uh, at the same time white has many options here uh, bishop c4 is one of the recent trends that we have in chess bishop b5 is most popular we also have the scotch but uh, surprisingly to everybody uh, fabiano br uh, actually decided to play knight to f6 and uh, knight to f6 this is what uh, we call the petrov uh, some people call it the russian defense and uh, basically so far it just looks like uh, black is copycatting from white um, so um, Grishuk here played not the main line. The main line for white is to take this pawn on e5. And uh, uh, I think that the idea for, for Grishuk, you know, he, Grishuk did not have any chances for first place at the time. So um, Grishuk, on the other hand, did want to create some sharp play, some, some, something very imbalanced. Um, also, uh, the reason why he didn't play that, in my opinion, is because uh, just a few games before that, uh, Karana was playing um, against Kramnik uh, in this variation and once he played d6 uh, knight went back to f3, knight takes uh, e2 here Kramnik instead of playing d4 the, the main line uh, Kramnik played the move queen to e2 and queen to e2 and then queen to e7 then really fast the, the, queen, the queens got, got exchanged and uh, something like this and uh, in this position um, uh, Caruana was playing black. It looks completely equal, but uh, Caruana was able to, to beat uh, Kramnik. And uh, again, um, you know, what's the only difference in this, in this position? And the only difference in this position, um, uh, schematically, is the, is the pawn structure. So we can see that on, on the queen side, uh, white has those double pawns, the c2 and the c3 pawns. I mean, most of the players would, would just say, okay, we're just equal. I mean, what, what, how can I make progress? Uh, but that's, that's a, that's a, this game is just going to be for another lecture. So in the game itself, uh, Grishuk decides to play this more of a sharp line, d4. And um, obviously the, the idea uh, of d4 is <laughs> to try to uh, commit black to taking this, this pawn on d4. Because once black takes this pawn on, on d4, uh, white has uh, a very good move, e5. It's kind of an intermediate move. I don't want to take on, on d4 immediately, but uh, I want to attack our knight on, on, on uh, f6. The knight will go to e4, and the idea is that now white will take uh, this pawn with a tempo. Uh, d6 is uh, d5 is usually being played. Pawn takes en passant. Knight takes en passant. Knight c3, knight c6, and queen f4, for example. So. Uh, in this variation, really, um, white, white has uh, some good chances, although the pawn structure remains the same, uh, but white has the more active pieces, and he can even choose between a short castle and, and long castle. So, after d4, uh, Karana decided to take on, on e4, and um, Again, uh, white here took on e5. The other line for white would be playing something like bishop to d3, uh, and this would uh, probably transpose to uh, one of the main lines in the, in the patch of defense. Uh, after, for example, d5, and maybe knight takes e5. Okay, so pawn takes on, uh, pawn takes on e5 was played. And now we need to play d5. So we have to, we have to hold this, this knight on, on e4. If we don't play this move d5, it's going to be very difficult. White is going to have the space advantage. And um, yeah, th we won't last for long. So knight b to d2 was played in the game. Uh, knight takes d2. We need to exchange. Bishop takes uh, d2. Bishop to e7. And uh, bishop to d3. Um, so here the other moves played some, some, uh, at some other games uh, between uh, Neponich and Mamdiarov. The, in their game they, played, they put the bishop on e2, but yeah, to me it looks like bishop to d3 is, is good enough. So bishop d3 was played, uh, c5, black is uh, gaining some, uh, some space on the queen side, c3, knight c6, and castle. Okay, so here is an interesting moment, I was watching this game um, live when it when it happened here from the from the St. Louis Chess Club, and um, 
Um, I noticed I noticed that uh, in the game itself, Black played this move uh, Bishop to G4, which uh, which looks which makes sense. I, I just developed my bishop and, and I pinned the knight, and maybe I want to take on E5. Um, but uh, you know, if 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 uh, Fabiano would look to if the results of the other board boards would be different, uh, let's say you know Karyakin would win already uh, uh, in in this point. Then I think that Fabiano would have to try to play for for a win himself, and there's a very interesting, uh, very risky move here that he can try. For example, this move g5. Um, very logical to to uh, to expose the king this way, but suddenly this is going to create lots of lots of imbalance, lots of tactical opportunities. Uh, the bishop can just simply go to e6, and the idea is maybe long castle. Of course, this is super risky. Uh, but uh, as we saw from other games in the candidate tournaments, um, such as uh, you know, Aronian Kramnik, where he, where he placed his rook on, on g8 and then pushed g5, uh, we, we've see, we, we see this uh, more and more often uh, in top-level chess, where uh, players decide not to castle and just start in, you know, the, the pawn storm. Okay, so bishop uh, to g4 has been played, rook to e1, defending the, po the pawn on e5, um, and queen to d7. Uh, so again, pay attention that black still keeps white in the dark um, as far as uh, for his intentions. I don't know if black is going to castle short side, I'm not sure if black is going to castle long side, maybe I'm going to keep my king in the center, and uh, this is quite, uh, quite unusual because... Um, you know, as, as kids, as beginner chess players, we always learn uh, castle, 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 you have to defend your king. But uh, basically this, those ideas, well, man, many of those ideas to keep the king in the center as long as possible, uh, we learned uh, you know, from, from technology. Uh, you know, the engines showed us that it, it is possible to keep, to keep this, the king in the center of the board for longer periods uh, and um, keep our opponents guessing. So queen d7, and now white played this uh, move h3. And now, uh, uh, so this position has been played before. Uh, however, now Karana makes his novelty, if you can call it a novelty, and he places the bishop on h5. Uh, the, other, the other game that, uh, that was played was uh, black played bishop to f5. In this case, white simply uh, you know, took, on, took on f5, or white can also play this move queen to, uh, queen to c2. Uh, and queen takes, bishop takes on d3, queen takes, castle, rook a d1, uh, queen e6 was played, and uh, I think that white has pretty good chances after uh, all those moves has be, have been made, uh, because without the white, the light square bishop, uh, this, this pawn here on d5 is going to be under attack all the time. So um, in the game, uh, Fabi decided to keep the bishops on the board by playing bishop to h5. Um, and now uh, white played this move bishop to f4, just, just supporting this, this pawn on e5, um, you know, also uh, kind of promotes the connection between the queen and the, and the bishop. Um, in this, in this position, uh, Fabiano played this move uh, queen to e6. Kind of a strange move. Why do we need the queen here on e6? Uh, so let's think about it. Well, again, black doesn't really know where he, where he should castle yet. Uh, maybe long, maybe short. Uh, if he tries to castle short, sometimes white has all those um, kind of tricks with bishop takes h7 and uh, creating, you know, this is the Greek gift uh, sacrifice. Um, black can, can make another waiting move, for example, h6 which will prevent uh, white from taking on h7 uh, and also prevent knight to g5. However, this move uh, pawn to h6 is actually a very great mistake. Uh, and so try, um, for our viewers online and our members here at the St. Louis Chess Club, try to figure out why is this move h6 uh, is so bad. How would white punish black? Push Correct, very good, yeah. So the transposition of moves. So in this case, white will play g4, attacking our, our bishop on h5. Uh, you can see, pay attention, that uh, these kinds of 
tricks will not work because our bishop can simply go to, to g3 and defend itself. And if bishop goes to, uh, to g6, then now we have this move, g e6. Bam. Now nah, it's hitting everything, not just the queen. Yeah. The pawn, and our, our bishop here is under attack. So we have to be very careful when we, when we don't castle. Um, so I, I assume this was Karana's preparation still, uh, because he played the, the, the opening stage pretty fast. And, you know, they have to know th those moves. Uh, yes, please, a question. Is it worth it to consider here g5, g4, because you get g5 as a g5, g4, so... For black. For black. Um, yeah, so right now, g5, g4. Okay, so if I take... That's interesting. Let's see this. Um... Yeah, I would, say, I would say this is possible. Then white will maybe go back with the bishop to, to g3. And now we, d we definitely need to castle uh, alongside. But yeah, maybe, maybe this was also possible. But again, uh, this is super risky. <laughs> um, okay, so this is why he played queen e6 in the game. Uh, a3. Um, you know, uh, white is, is starting to prepare his expansion on the queen side. And here is where Fabiano sees, okay, well, if I cast alongside, I don't want to get into those sharp positions where we have opposite side castling. And so he decides just to cast a short. B4 was, has been played. Um, and now he played H6. So again, this move is very important because... Uh, uh, basically, this allows any kind of tactical opportunities for, for white. So h6, bishop to g3, and b6. So this position is, is, is quite equal. Um, we have some kind of an imbalance in the pawn structure, but uh, overall it's pretty equal position. Um, so what, what, to do here, how, how, what to do here with white? Let's say if you're playing here with white. Um, Alexander Grishuk find a very tactical solution to the problem. Uh, the problem was is that he, he wasted lots of time. Um, so let me just free the, free the board and uh, let's say you're playing as, uh, the white pieces. Yeah, so that, that pin is, is pretty annoying, right? And that, that's the whole problem in the position. So Grishuk find a very tactical, uh, tactical option here, and he played in the game uh, this move knight to d4. So your idea is correct. You want to get the queen out, not to b3, because uh, on b3 black can follow with c4 maybe, but I think maybe uh, he could have played queen c2. And now black needs to face this, uh, this idea that, uh, first of all, uh, he cannot take here on, on, f on f3 uh, because of, yeah, bishop f5 and uh, the queen get, gets captured and uh, or, we t or we take the bishop first and, we then, and then we have all kinds of threats with bishop f5 and f4 uh, so in this position black would have to play something like uh, bishop g6 and in this case we can either take the bishop and or play rook a d1 immediately um, or play it afterwards and I think keeping the, keeping the, the queens on the board would allow Grishchuk to, uh, to have more again more chances in the game uh, because uh, the problem was is that, uh, you know, it's, it's also all about time management. And um, in this position, he, he played this brave move, knight to d4, uh, attacking the king on, on e6 and, you know, sacrificing our queen here. Obviously, this move, knight to d4, will require lots of calculations. And, uh, well, why is that? Because black has many candidate moves, right? Black can take this knight with a pawn. He can take it to the knight, he can take the, qu the queen, and maybe he can move the queen. So it requires us lots of effort and, and time to calculate all of that. And uh, I also don't think that uh, it was the, the correct decision for him to go to an end game. Um, you know, because eventually if we exchange all the pieces, you might be safer, but again, white is the one who is um, playing for a win. Okay, so knight, knight to d4 has been played. Uh, black needs to take the queen, knight takes uh, queen, pawn takes, and rook a takes on d1. 
Well, on the other hand, white, uh, on, uh, you know, from, from white perspective, white got the two bishop advantage. So that's something, right? I mean, uh, the two bishop advantage uh, decides many times, many, many games. Okay, so let's see how is your end game uh, play. And so black to move, what to do here with black? We need a plan. Uh, white has those two bishops. White has, seemingly, he has the better rooks as well. Um, but so so how to play next okay so you're saying c4 why is that why would you push your pawn okay so you want to lock down the position okay anybody else so right now what happened is what we call a transformation of a position we basically transform from one stage of the game to another so we have three stages of, of the game. We have the opening, the middle game, and the end game. So w every time that we do such a transformation, we, we really, I, I always tell to my students, you know, take your time, you know, take, take a, at least five minutes and then think about it, if you have the time, obviously. But uh, uh, because that's, that's where you have to replan um, and reassess the position. So we went from a middle game uh, to kind of an end game, and end game play is much, much different. I mean, we know that, for example, we can uh, use a king in the end game. So what? So do we need to play king f7 here immediately? Well, probably not, not yet, right? Because there are still lots of pieces on the, on the board. So the question becomes, uh, you know, what kind of a position do we want? Do we want to uh, open up the position? Do we want to take on b4 or play a5 to open this up? Do we want, do, do we want to lock the position with c4? Um, so how do we how do we manage how do we assess the, the position that's that's the difficult part so so first of all um, let's let's answer a question number one we do we want to open up the position or do we want to close it close open open okay so why why open and one why close yeah yeah Okay, so you're saying let's put the rook here on d8 and stop pushing those pawns. All right. Yes. White has two bishops, so let's force rook into a bishop that has access. Okay, so you're saying white has the two bishops, and uh, that's why we need to close the position because we need to close the bishops. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Anybody else? So yeah, so we have the two views, and uh, again, this is that's the difference, right? That's the difference of an opposition. We have, uh, you know, we the opponent has the two bishops, and we know that the two bishops they really like open positions. So where, when, uh, what are the knights like more close positions? So I think this is why Karana chose to to play more of a, a close position. For example, if I play rook a d8, which was suggested, probably immediately White can play something like bishop to b5, and you know, he can annoy us and uh, maybe he can put the rook here on, on, on d2 to attack this, this pawn. So he eventually he did play that, that plan, by the way. He just, uh, he just he, he needed some time to rearrange his pieces. So c4, this is how we close it. And so why c4? You know, uh, as, as somebody said here in the audience, we want to put our pawns on light squares. Why is that? Because our bishop is dark. Okay? We always want to put the, our pawns on the opposite side, on the opposite color of our bishop. Uh, because then our bishop is going to be much, much more open. So c4 has been played. Bishop c2, b5. White tries to open up the position with a4, and we say, uh uh, a6. There was another uh, more risky option here. Instead of a6, black can, could also play a5. And uh, the idea is that if white takes on here on b5, then we can even sacrifice our knight. Pawn takes. Pawn takes. And uh, yeah, do we, black has three pass pawns. White has one pass pawn. It's almost like a chaos here on the board. I mean, yeah, I don't even know who is better. It looks scary for both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty much playing for three results over here. So again, um, you know, Fabiano takes the more conservative uh, 
approach, and he just plays a6. Let's let's see what happens. Why why don't why do I need to risk it? Uh, f3 was has been has been played. Okay, so in this position, uh, again, black need, needed to to uh, to decide. Again, black could have uh, uh, sacrificed this knight. So, for example, again, knight takes before and and go to this end game. Uh, but instead, uh, Fabiano just played bishop to g5, uh, improving his bishop. So far, makes makes sense. Bishop to uh, f2. Uh, the bishop here uh, on on g3 really did not do much. I mean, just defending this. Um, the spawn on, on e5, so why decides to transfer the bishop somewhere, somewhere closer, uh, somewhere more active? Uh, so bishop to f2 has, has been played, and bishop f4 attacking this, this pawn on e5. Um, bishop c5, uh, white puts his bishop here with a tempo. And as the, as the gentleman here suggested, the rook goes on, D, on d8 uh, because in the future uh, black will try to open up the position with d4. So rook f d8 and bishop to g d6. Okay, so uh, the bi the bishop came here behind enemy lines, but he's doing pretty good job. He's blocking the, the rook here on d8, and he's defending the pawn. Uh, he's taking away some some other. Uh, good squares for, for black, uh, so pretty good bishop here on d6. Okay, so black to black to move here. What to do next? Yeah, and so in the game he played this this idea bishop g3. So what's the purpose of bishop g3? It's attacking the rook as well as the next step. It's uh, blocking the h2 and uh, f2. Exactly, very good. So this was this was the this was the correct move. Bishop g3. And the idea is not just to attack the, the rook here. The idea was to restrict the white king from coming to f2 and h2. And uh, for example, if black would do anything else, and uh, let's say I play king f7, then really it will give white some, some chances after king f2, then he's gonna push g3, he's gonna push f4. So this restriction move, bishop to g3, this kind of an out outpost for the bishop, is really, really important in the game. Um, so bishop g3, rook e2, and now uh, black gets some space, g5, king f1, king f7, now bishop to, to c1, uh, to c7, attacking, attacking this, uh, uh, this rook, uh, rook e8 has been played. And bishop to d6. So white is going backwards and forward with the bishop. So how do we call it? A loss of tempo. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we might call it a loss of tempo. Uh, but in top chess, uh, chess players, uh, they call it um, kind of an unofficial draw offer. You know that uh, usually in a chess game, you, uh, you are allowed to offer a draw. In top ch but in top chess games, when, when you uh, chess playing is your livelihood, when you offer somebody a draw, uh, um, it can be uh, seen as an act of weakness. Because uh, when you offer a draw to somebody, something is wrong. You, you, don't, you either don't see how to win a position, or maybe you feel bad, or, or stuff like that. So, you know, if you offer a draw, it's, uh, it's kind of you're making yourself uh, the, you know, very vulnerable to the opponent. Uh, and if he declines it, you, you feel like, oh, well, you know, you have to somehow, you're in a worse position, even if, you, if you're not. Uh, so instead, what top chess, chess players do in the world is that they are trying to repeat moves. In this way, you know, you don't, you're, it's not really a draw offer, but you're just repeating moves. And uh, for example, if Karana would play you know, rook d8, and they would continue to, to repeat the moves, well, then a draw would be signed. So, so this is pretty much how they uh, offer a draw. Okay, well, uh, what would be the, the best way to, I guess, to decline that draw? Not only not to play rook to d8, but uh, what, what other move can we play? So black to move. Rook on? Rook on a, which move is that? 
Yeah, so you, you can play either rook to a7, yeah, or in the game he plays rook a to c8. That, that's a, that's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, impressive decline, right? I mean, okay, if you want to repeat moves, go ahead. Play <laughs> bishop c7. That, that's fine with me. But uh, I can't promise you that I'm going to play rook a8, though, next move, you know? So, uh, so, so rook to, uh, that's, that's a pretty bold statement. So rook, rook to c8 has been played. Um, rook a1. Okay, so the only chance that white has in this position is really everything has to do with the A-file. There is nothing else he can do. Um, I mean, look at all those pawns here. This pawn structure, is everything is just fixed and locked. No F4, no H4 is possible. And this is really why black gets this minor, minor advantage, I would say. Uh, we cannot see it, but uh, it's the potential for creating a pass pawn. It's all about the pass pawns here. Um, so here, white will never be able to get a pass pawn un unless some, some miracle happens. Uh, black, because black fix fixes those pawns over here. On the other hand, this pawn structure, at some point, we can push d4, and uh, thus creating the, the c pawn becoming a pass pawn. So uh, white decides to put his rook on the A file, which which I think was was a good uh, move. Uh, rook e to d8. Black comes back now. Okay, so what to do here with white? It's not so easy to play for with white. Take on b5. Yeah, we can take on b5, and if black takes. Not the check on a7, but white can play rook a6. Now, what is the problem in this, uh, in this, in this idea, rook a6? It looks like we're activating a rook. It's good. We're going forward. But there's a minor problem. Uh, yeah, black can other play d4 maybe, yes. And there's another one. That's correct. So what's the weakness of this move, rook a1, no, rook a6? It weakens the first, the back rank. So now black can play rook a8. And if we take the knight, oh, oops, it's a mate in two, or in three, if I give up the bishop. <laughs> so in this case, white would have to take the rook, because we don't have a backup rook. We can't just do this move. I wish that the rook can jump over pieces, but he can't yet. <laughs> Uh, and if it takes the rook, the rook takes, and suddenly black is the one with the control of all of the A file. If black can get the control of all of the A file, that's, I mean, that, I, I, you can't even stop rook A1. So that's pretty bad. So you can see how this position is pretty difficult for white to play, even though, I mean, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, white is almost has more space. He has the two bishops. So taking on b5 is not an option. I think that in the game, uh, what Grishuk uh, played was probably one of the uh, moves that started his, his defeat. He played this move, uh, bishop to b1. And I always say to my students, if you don't have to go backwards, don't do it. I mean, the, the bishop to b1 does not give you anything. Um, you know, the bishop on c2 is doing a good job in defending the a4 square. So if I were him, I would, you know, if you don't have plan, well, stick to, stick to the plan that you had before, which was repeating the moves. So I will, if I were him, I would just play rook d1. And just go back and say, well, you know, maybe I don't have a plan, but show me yours. And especially the, the rook is going to come here to prevent this move d4. So rook to b1 uh, was kind of a waiting move that white uh, did. And um, now black played rook to d7. And now again, uh, so what, what to do here with white? So black just played this move, rook to d7. Let's look at this position. It's an inter interesting position. I think that probably here, white made a decisive move, a uh, decisive mistake. Uh, it doesn't look like a decisive mistake, but he made another waiting move. He played this move, rook to a3. Uh, we don't see it right now, but it actually probably the, the move that lost the game. But what to do here instead? 
There's a, there's a different plan. Always ask yourself what is changing the position. So black just played this move rook to d7. Even though the move the move doesn't look like much, uh, it just looks like a waiting move. Every move has a, an advantage and a disadvantage. And you need to figure out what's the disadvantage in that move. Mm. Yeah, but if I play, if yeah, so the bishop on g3 is super annoying, right? There is no doubt about that. But if we, we play bishop c5, I'm just gonna take on e5 with the bishop, and and then uh, let's say the bishop is gonna take here, then I'm gonna take even c3. So, <laughs> and then before it's gonna be like a domino effect. <laughs> yes, please. Exactly. Exactly. Very good job. So now, when the rook is here on d7, we don't have this double pawn, double rooks on 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 a8. Okay. So now white can take here on b5 and play this move rook a6. Now I can activate my rook. Now, now black cannot uh, allow you to to keep this rook on a6. Otherwise, soon I'm gonna bring the other rook and then you know get it, get in, in get in there. Uh, so black has to play, for example, uh, rook a7. We need to exchange the rooks. Take, we have to exchange. Take, rook a2, knight c6, and bring the other rook in. Now, although in this variation, we are sacrificing a pawn. So for example, knight takes on e5. Uh, we obviously cannot take with a bishop, right? Everybody can see why we can't take with a bishop? Exactly, rook c6. You guys are sharp today. Um, so knight takes, knight takes e5, it looks like we just lost a pawn, but hey, look at our pieces. I mean, suddenly our bishop is attacking, not defending. This bishop is attacking, not defending. This rook is attacking, not defending. So for example, white can uh, simply play here rook a7 check. King has to go, yep, yeah, he cannot go up because of bishop e7. Yeah, that's 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 pretty dangerous. So he has to go, well, up this way, I guess. Uh, king to g8, and now we can, for example, check on h7, and now bishop goes back to c2. And yes, we are a pawn down. But hey, I mean, he cannot move his his knight, he cannot move his bishop, his rook doesn't have any good spots, and so this is what we what we got. Uh, now we got this compensation, what we call. And I actually would prefer here to be white suddenly. So this was, uh, this was the opportunity that, that, that White kind of lost uh, in the game and he could take on, on b5, but instead he played this move rook to a3, a very, um, a very bad move. Okay, so black, black to move, what do we do now? It is the time. <coughs> it's the D-Day. <laughs> Let the invasion begin. D4. All forces ahead. <laughs> now the problem is that suddenly the, those two rooks, which, which were on the, usually on the first rank, suddenly they are not there. So now he, white will have to cope with all those threats uh, with, with some mate. So D4 was played. Uh, A takes B5. A takes B5. Now white cannot allow black to play this move D3. So that's going to be devastating. Uh, so he takes on d4. Knight takes on d4, attacking the rook. Rook a2, rook e2, a2. Okay, so still, uh, yeah, I mean, at least so black got a, got this pawn, this pass pawn on on c4. But white is planning to come and visit us here on the on the back ranks. Um, Black to move, what to do next? Rook c6. Rook c6. Knight c6. Knight c6, and what's the idea? Take the d4 pawn and take on the two rooks. If the rook comes to the six. Right, that's correct. So now we want to focus on the weaknesses. b4 and e5. Right now they're defended by the bishop, but the bishop really cannot defend everybody. It's a bishop, it's not a superman. So b knight going back to c6. Um, 
C3 was also was also possible uh, in this position we played by black, but again, uh, it will require more calculation. So again, uh, Karana is taking the safer route and just plays knight c6. Uh, bishop e4 was played because we cannot defend we cannot defend this pawn. For example, if rook e2, then we can simply take the pawn on e5. Take and rook to d1. Oopsie. Okay, so uh, why decides to sacrifice this pawn? I guess it's if you can call it a sacrifice. <laughs> um, bishop to e4, bishop takes on e5. Uh, here it's kind of a strange, but white has to choose between which uh, w who to take, the knight or the bishop. Uh, in the game, uh, Grishuk took took the knight. I think maybe the, taking the bishop would give him a slight more chances uh, due to take taken rook a5, and now. Uh, you know, at least he, st he starts to annoy uh, black, and you know, at least I have a bishop for for that for that lost pawn. And bishops are much better in, in the end game, as as you can see. This this bishop is not bad at all, uh, covering all those. This is actually pretty much the most optimal square for the bishop in a, in a chess game. So instead, uh, Grishu decided to take uh, the knight instead, uh, and. A rook takes on d6, must, has been played, and bishop takes on b5. Yeah, so white got a, uh, got his pawn back, but now it allowed black to push his pawn. Um, I think I'm, I actually am in the wrong... Wait a second. Yeah, so rook to d1 check has been played, king to e2, rook to g1, king to e3, rook to b1, rook to b1 has been played, uh, attacking the, the pawn before, and uh, rook a7 check, um, and king to f6. Uh, so this is, this is, by the way, move number 40. Uh, so they made the, the time control and they, get, they got the extra time. Bishop d7, now bishop f4. King to e2, rook to d8. And um, white played rook to c2. Okay, so black to move. So what do we do here? Do we take this pawn before or we don't take this pawn before? Uh, yeah, well, it's black to move. Do we so black to move? So white to play the rook to c two. So do we take the, this pawn before we don't take it? No. Or it's poisoned. <laughs> we can take I it, but there is something play. better. <laughs> you can't remember. Yeah. I think I think it's the same. I, I think it's the same thing Karana told to himself. Yeah. But I can take the pawn, but I think that there is something better. I just can't remember my preparation. Oh, this <laughs> move number forty one. You know something. <laughs> Yeah, rook c1 is, is, is definitely possible. Now the question in those kind of positions, if you, if, you can, if you can see, we have the opposite color bishops. We have also the rooks. Uh, but do we want to exchange all the rooks? And the, the answer is probably no. If we exchange all the rooks, we're going to get to a right, drawish endgame. So we have to be very, very careful when we, when we uh, exchange the, those rooks. So at least you have to keep one of them. So maybe rook c1 is... Uh, not draw immediately, but it definitely, in my opinion, helps black. So in the game, uh, Fabiano took this this, this pawn on on before. Um, you know, it's it's a pass pawn. We can just snap it. But the other way to think about it is that there is there are also some weaknesses, and the other weakness was on g2. So the other uh, move that, that we actually were looking here when we were watching the the show, the live game at the, ch at the chess club was rook to g1. Uh, it's very difficult to, to make such a decision during, during the game, uh, but here is the idea. If the king goes to f2 uh, and defends the pawn and attacks the rook, uh, we can go rook to d1. Attacking the bishop on d7 from both sides, and uh, he has to move the bishop, let's say, and now we exchange the rook, but the point is, is that now we play c3 and then push, push. 
um, th this is uh, this this pawn is unstoppable now. Uh, if white tries to play g4, uh, black can play this very very unique move, subtle move rook to h1. Uh, the threat is to take this pawn and the rook h2. And now if it takes this this uh, pawn on c4, we can check. And now rook to d2. So yeah, so this was this was possible, but again, Karana ch uh, chooses the, the safest route. Just rook takes on before. I mean, this 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 pawn on g2 is not going anywhere. So right now, I'm just uh, playing a, a winning endgame with a with a pawn up. Um, so bishop to c6 was has been played. C3 and rook to d7. So as we said, white is the one who is trying to exchange the rooks. Yes. Exactly. So around, around this moment, uh, the other uh, games were finished, and Karyakin, uh, so Karyakin and Mamidiyarov, they both drew. And this, this, you know, this was a very interesting question to see. Do you just draw? You know, you if you offer a draw, you're just a pawn up. There is no, for example, if I just take this rook, and I play rook b2, and you know, I just exchange exchange everything. There is no way to, to lose this. I mean, even if I give up the, this pawn and this pawn, and I put this pawn on h4, there's simply a draw. There's just no, not nothing to do. So the question was, would he, would uh, Fabiano, you know, offer a draw or agree to a draw? And uh, here, uh, I think we also had a, a Skype call with Gary Kasparov and um, other commentators here. Everybody agreed that, yeah, sure, you know, everybody would do it. You know, the the, the tournament is over and you're gonna win clear first, half point ahead, and yeah, I mean, well, what's, what's, the, what's the point? Well, the point is that you can't, you can't lose any, anyway, so unless you really, really blunder. And in this, in this uh, point, he decided just to keep, keep going. Um, that's, uh, that's very impressive. So he plays rook c8, keeping the, bo the, the, the rooks on the board. The bishop goes back. And now h5. So the idea is again we we want to fix this this weakness on 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 g2 by playing h4 next. Also gets it uh, get gets rid of our uh, weakness because maybe white can come here to h7 and attack this. So h5 has been played. King to d3, rook to b2, king to e2, h4, rook to d1. The king comes in. Rook to a1, rook to d8, rook to d1. So <laughs> white is, is simply waiting. There's nothing much white can do uh, and just, uh, you know, just to pray for some kind of a queen exchange. Rook d to b8, rook to a1, bishop d2. Um, I think that, uh, you know, objectively, white is the one who is spending much, much more time in, on every move because you know, every move can, can, can lose the, the game. Uh, and so white is spending much more time. And, and for black, it's just easy to make just random moves. Um, so rook to a6 has been played. Rook d8, rook c6, rook b1. King f2 has been played. Rook a1, rook c4, rook d4. Going back and forth, rook b4, king e2, king f4, f and king to f2. Um, so white, uh, so so it's black to move in this position. And if you remember, I I, I posed this question that just in the beginning of the video: how much uh, a pawn touch? can be worth in, in value, in dollars. Let's say I just, I just come to any chessboard and I just touch a pawn just slightly. And um, at least from, from this game, I would put it in $500,000, in half a million dollars. And why is that? What, what happens if, if black touches the wrong pawn? If black play touches this pawn on E6, just even slightly, and all the cameras are watching. You can't just like go go back. Uh, 
and if it plays e5, you lose in one move. And you just get checkmated in one move. And so you want win the first place, uh, you want to win the first uh, prize, so you probably win like uh, place number four, uh, going from, I think the first prize was like 120 something yeah. thousand dollars. So you're gonna get only like 80 or 70, so you get to lose $50,000 over there. But the worst, worst part is that you won't be playing in the candidates. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, in the world championship. And you know, the world championship, I think that the prize fund is 750 for first place yeah. and 500 for second place. Plus sponsorship. And plus sponsorship and, and you know, all the, all the glory. Uh, so it's, yeah. I would say all together is probably a million, million dollars, maybe millions of dollars. So this is how a, just a touch of a pawn can cost you uh, millions of dollars. So be careful when you touch those pawns. Huh? Yeah. Um, so uh, king f2 has been played. So instead, uh, Fabiano played rook b2, b1. Rook to f8 check now, king to e5, uh, bishop d3, rook to e1 check king to f2, and now comes the final stage where black Fabiano played this move, rook to c1. Basically forcing this rook on c2 to make a decision, hey, which, uh, choose, uh, buddy, which rook do you, would you like to, would you prefer to, to take? In this case, he, 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 uh, white took on b2, but even if he would, you know, if, even if, it, if he would take uh, the c1 rook, then this would end in a check, King f1 and then bishop f4 and this again this 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 pawn is very difficult to, to stop. So rook takes on b2, c takes on b2. Um, I want a queen on b1. Rook to uh, b8. Start time to stop him, but he again black can just make some some random moves. I mean obviously he makes progress. The overall idea for black is eventually bringing the king here to g3. Once I bring the, my king to g3 and I start snapping all those pawns, I can get another pass pawn and this, the game is going to be over. And this is exactly what he is doing. He plays king f4, rook to b4, e5 now, rook to b7, and king to g3. And this is where black just wants to take this pawn either this way or I can bring my rook in here and Again, once I snap this one off the board, I'm going to snap this one off the board. And once this guy keeps running, that's uh, going to be uh, game over. So this is where uh, Grishuk decided to, um, you know, to, to, to resign. And uh, Fabiano Corana became probably uh, the candidate for the World Championship. And we are going to look forward to it in November uh, in, uh, in London. Um, so good job, uh, Fabi, and uh, good luck, good luck in London. Mm -hmm.